casual talk of violence has become the currency in American politics these days, especially on the right. Whether it's dreams of civil war or talk of taking up arms in the name of a politician. And many are repeat offenders. Just listen to Arizona Republican Carrie Lake, who is running for the Senate seat in that state. Listen to her talk about the upcoming election and Donald Trump. He's willing to sacrifice everything I am. That's why they're coming after us with lawfare. They're going to come after us with everything. That's why the next six months is going to be intense. We're going to strap on our, our seatbelt. We're going to put on our helmet or your Carrie Lake ball cap. We are going to put on the armor of God. And maybe strap on a Glock on the side of us just in case. You can put one here and one in the back or one in the front, whatever you guys decide, because we're not going to be the victims of crime. And this is Carrie Lake last year after Trump was indicted for his handling of classified documents. We are, we're at war, people. If you want to get to President Trump, you're going to have to go through me and you're going to have to go through 75 million Americans just like me. And I'm going to tell you, yep, most of us are card-carrying members of the NRA. That's not a threat. That's a public service announcement. <laughs> Look, Carrie Lake is not an anomaly. Just this week, as pro-Palestinian protesters were shutting down U.S. landmarks, Senator Tom Cotton suggested that people take matters into their own hands, whether it be throwing them off bridges or ripping off their skin. Joining me now is Amanda Carpenter, writer and editor at Protect Democracy and a former senior staffer to Senators Jim DeMint and Ted Cruz. Also with us, Mehdi Hassan, the editor-in-chief and CEO of the media company Zateo and author of the book, Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Thanks both of you for being here. Amanda, uh, Senator Cotton, he actually defended his language today. Um, and then the next day, uh, the very, and the very next day as well. I mean, it just is so striking to me that this is, it's not even just these one-off things. It's also just that this is what the base is demanding and the members of Congress or the candidates are giving it to them. It is a thirst for violence. Yeah, I find the case of Tom Cotton especially disturbing because he is a person with a military background who certainly knows of what he speaks. I mean, this is not a one-off from Tom Cotton. You recall that the op-ed that he wrote the New York Times during the Black Lives Matter protest, in which he supported invoking the Insurrection Act to send troops to U.S. cities to put down these protests. And when I look at someone like Tom Cotton, you know, you don't put those words to a page with his background without knowing very deliberately what you are asking for. And he saw the blowback, and he still says things like this, I essentially want political violence to put down political speech I do not like. And so when you look at a figure like him and then you look at the prospect of a Trump second term, Tom Cotton is someone that could play a very prominent role in a second Trump administration. And so, you know, I think we need to pay very special, careful attention uh, to that. A harbinger of things to come, perhaps. Tom Cotton loves violence. Let's just be clear about that. Amanda mentions June 2020, he talked about no quarter giving no quarter to protesters. No quarter means kill them all. It's a war crime. Uh, he also recently about Gaza, he said, let bounce rubble in Gaza, which means destroy it all. Um, and now he's talking about basically using violence against pro-Palestinian protesters. I would remind you all uh, that at the start of this conflict, a little six-year-old boy in Illinois, Wadia, uh, was stabbed to death multiple times um, uh, in what was a hate crime. Um, because of incitement like this, this is a kind of... Language has consequences. Words matter. When Carrie Lake talks about strapping on glocks, when Tom Cotton talks about taking action into your own hands, people act on this stuff. When Donald Trump says, fight like hell, people go to the Capitol and but fight like hell. It, Republicans say this stuff, and then there are consequences. It is, though, a, a very Trumpism to basically treat words like they don't matter. Like, it's all just wordplay and fun and games. I mean... Has that just become the, the way that Republicans are expected to operate? I'm, I'm talking about the Republican Party in particular, because this is where we are seeing this kind of rhetoric escalating the most. Yeah, but it's not... I mean, they know what they're doing. 
Carrie Lake, this is not MTG or Lauren Boebert. Carrie Lake knows what she's doing. Tom Cotton, Harvard grad, knows what he's doing. And the consequences are very clear. This is not just fun and games. When Mitt Romney goes on the record and says, there were members in the House who wanted to vote, GOP members who wanted to vote to impeach Donald Trump, but they were scared for their families. They were worried about the safety of their wife and kids, a lot of these Republican men. That is a deliberate tactic by Trump, the mafia boss, and the little mafia bosses below him to enforce order both within the party and now within the country. One in three Americans, tells pollsters, one in three Republicans, excuse me, has said that they believe that patriots need to resort to violence to save this country. One in three Republicans. That's a scary statistic. Yeah, and that's been increasing. There's been increasingly this idea among... Uh, you know, Trump supporters, that violence is, in fact, inevitable, that it's perhaps the answer to the discord in the country. January 6th was the f opening salvo in, for some of them of that. Where does it go next? Well, I think this is why you see a lot of uh, the so-called smart set that is positioning around Donald Trump, Project 2025, Heritage Foundation, et cetera, talking about things like invoking the Insurrection Act. I mean, this keeps coming up. Um, and, you know, you talk about, like, well, how does this manifest itself? One of the things that I encounter a lot talking to Republicans is the idea they push back is like, it's just rhetoric. I can separate the rhetoric from the policy. And I push back on that every single time because the rhetoric is how you explain the policy. You know, when he talks about calling the January 6th rioters hostages and patriots, that is a policy that, that translates into pardoning them and then providing a license for more political violence to advance his political aims. And so, like, you just have to put down this idea that, like, he's just saying things because words it's do become action. It's specifically... Um, within this role that he wants to play in a second administration. And, and you can't even give the benefit of the doubt, because this is not 2015 when he was saying, I'm going to pay the legal bills for anyone who punches a protester, which he didn't, by the way, pay any legal bills. Then we saw an entire term. You were talking about the opening salvo. I mean, we saw an entire term of Donald Trump in office before January 6th, where people went into synagogues and gunned people down using the same language as Trump. A guy in New Zealand went and shot up a mo two mosques and said, Trump's my hero. The Walmart uh, shooter. You know, the Walmart shooter used the invasion language, great replacement theory. All of this stuff happened on Trump's time. And now Trump is, what did he share recently? The picture of Biden um, gagged and bound at the back of a truck. If we did that, I think the Secret Service would be coming to our door, but that's well, Donald Trump. Speaking of Trump, paying or not paying legal bills. <laughs> His campaign is now um, in their thirst for money, asking Republican candidates and committees who are using the Trump name and likeness to fundraise to give at least 5% of what they raise back to the Trump campaign. Just a reminder, some of this money is going to pay his legal bills here. That's according to a letter obtained by CNN. I mean, how... Is that unusual? How unusual? Yes, is of that? course it is. Yes, it's totally. <laughs> and I just picture like all his, you know, Trump campaign staffers going through the FEC reports that uh, campaigns have to file to me. Like, oh, okay, they had a good year. Kick up your five percent. I mean, really, like, where does this end? Why is it only five percent? Why didn't you start sooner? Apparently, if everybody's going to roll over and say, sure, I'll kick it up, it isn't going to end with just five well, percent. Here's like, the thing: like, you Protection are part money. of this deal. Here's, okay, so I mean, here's... you've got to admire him for only asking for five well, percent. For Donald here... Trump, I'm amazed it was only five percent. Here is the other part of the letter. Okay, it says any split that is higher than five percent will be seen favorably by the RNC and the president's Tribute. campaign, and is routinely reported to the highest levels of the campaign. I mean, I'll be honest with you, Abby. I'm not bothered by this. I actually think take five, take ten, fifty. <laughs> it's his party, right? It's his personal fiefdom. It's his personal property. Yeah. His daughter-in-law runs the damn thing. Take five, take 50. It's your choice all... if you want to exactly, give him 50%. Exactly, exactly. Sure. Or, and if you don't give 5%, maybe he'll send round the goons. Maybe you'll get the death threats. I mean, look, this is the Republican Party it now. It does say so much about the RNC and the Republican Party that it's like, the message is, Trump will find out whether you've given us five or 10. Hey, Those hey. are the funders and emails I get in my impacts every day. <laughs> <laughs> from the Trump camp. It's always these kind of, like, heavy pressure tactics. We're watching you. Why haven't but you donated yet? But there is no Republican now, Party left it's... anymore. It's a, it's a Trump MAGA party. It's his private property. This is how he does business. His entire career is based on licensing his name and getting cutbacks. Yeah. Why wouldn't he do that to the GOP? And let them pay him. I mean, to be fair, they are all using his name and likeness. That's so true. He, but he that's has what... control over that. I would say that, that, that is traditional in most campaigns when you're looking for leadership in the party. Traditionally, an incumbent president would be happy to lend his name and likeness to bring the Joe party Joe up. Biden but would, instead, Joe Biden would love if people were using his imagery right now. <laughs> yeah. Slap, slapping a 5% tax on top of those contributions. Or Amanda, else. Amanda Carpenter and Mehdi Hassan, thank you both very much.